Good morning. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see your shiny, happy faces. Show them off to someone this morning. Not just one, let's make it two. Two people, show off a smile, go. All right, so there's nothing going on this week. Let's say a prayer. No, I'm just kidding. It is busy, busy, busy. So let me highlight some things that uh, it's going to happen this week. Let's start with today. Right after the service, just don't eat lunch. Take a quick nap and then get ready to eat. We have progressive supper starting at 5 o'clock. Now, let's look over the rules. The rules can be broken a little bit. It's okay. But here's some uh, ways to help you prepare for tonight. So if you are in the age group of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, you will provide a, an appetizer to be taken to the Ponder's house. And if you are 50s and 60s age group, you'll provi provide a main dish, casserole, crock pot, make it easy. And then if you're 70s, 80s, or 90s, you'll have a dessert that will go to the church. Now, if you're wondering, where are these people's houses? I think, ah, yes. I did add the addresses, so quickly remember those numbers, or take a picture, or what you do, you just carpool. Just carpool, and we'll all get to the, the place at the same time as we should. Now, if you are at a certain age between 0 to 49, there's a, a schedule that you'll follow. It's listed in your bulletin. And if you're 50 and older, there's another schedule that you'll follow. But then we'll all end up here at the church for dessert, okay? Appetizers at the Ponders, main dish at the Hauntses. And now the Hauntses would ask that you go past their drive and go to the next drive and go park behind their house. A lot more parking back there, okay? But just get ready to eat, okay? We're going to have fun and celebrate with food. Um, this week, let's look into what's going on. Um, this Tuesday at 6.30 that evening, if you have nothing to do, well, good, get here because it's going to be a cute little daycare program, 6.30 on Tuesday. And then we have supper on Wednesday, which is actually breakfast slash supper, and that will be at 5.30. And then at 6 o'clock, we will have the usual prayer and devotional time. Um, but kiddos, kids, we're going to leave right after supper slash breakfast, and we're going to go to the Whitaker's house and have crafts and drink hot chocolate. And then when you adults are finished, y'all can pick us up, okay? We're going to have some fun Christmasing, crafting, and cocoa drinking. Um, and then youth, write this down. We have our Christmas party next Sunday at 5 o'clock at the Freeman's house. Bring a gag gift. All right? Now, we know what's going on. It's a pretty busy week. Hopefully you're prepared. Now, let's prepare ourselves for the service. So would you please pray with me? Lord of power, as you bless the poor and meek and comfort those who weep and mourn, give us the spirit to lead us into your ways of compassion and love. Through making us disciples of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And let's stand as we sing this wonderful hymn. 125, if you want to use the book. Joy to the world. Let's sing it. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And have and have and nature sing. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations true. The glory 
gathered to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish I could hear myself. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to be here on the second Sunday of Advent, which is the, uh, the day that we think of peace. And so uh, we're going to have some things in the service that are geared towards that theme as we think about Jesus Christ, who is our Prince of Peace. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of put on your radar today uh, is, we mentioned it a few times, but I want to make sure that we get the right information out to you, uh, is that you might have seen some of these flyers around with some uh, salmon-colored uh, backgrounds on it. Uh, this is an informational flyer for our marriage conference that we're going to be hosting here at the church January 19th and 20th. That's a Friday evening and Saturday during the day. Uh, our friends Rusty and Becky Summerall from Nashville are coming to facilitate that conference here. Um, and Samantha and I have been through, the re- through this regimen before, and it was very edifying for us and our relationship. So we wanted to uh, let everyone know about that. And this is open to people who are outside of our church, so feel free to invite others as well. But you can find more information. You can find this sheet in the foyer back there. There's also a sign-up sheet there, uh, as, as well as ways you can sign up online uh, via this QR code. So wanted to put that in your, on your radar. I will have more handouts in the weeks to come for different things, uh, but this is the handout of this week. Okay. Now that I've said that, let's bow our heads and let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you on this second Sunday of Advent as we consider peace. God, we ask that you would send your peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, and your mercy permit it to reign in our midst. God, we want to pray for those who we've seen on the news today, both Uh, in our own state, but also up in Middle Tennessee and perhaps elsewhere who have suffered damage in the storms of the last, uh, that happened last night. Uh, We pray for the families of those who lost loved ones, but also for those who've suffered uh, damage to their homes. Uh, I know today of churches that are not able to meet because they can't get to their properties because of how many downed trees there are. Uh, God, I pray that that energy that they have uh, to worship, that, that you would empower them in the days and weeks to come. Uh, those churches to reach out to their neighbors to help in the relief efforts. Uh, But God, we just pray that you would provide resources, provide people, but also that you would provide comfort and peace to those who are grieving today. God, as we consider our world, again, we are uh, always disheartened by uh, stories of war uh, and conflict around the world, stories of famine and suffering. Um, And God, we pray that in these circumstances, you would also reign in your peace. Uh, Father, we pray for the conflict in Israel and Gaza right now, that you would protect all Israeli and Gazan civilians from attack. God, we pray that you would help help there to be an end to that conflict soon. We pray also for conflicts that have been going for even longer, for the conflict in Ukraine and in other places. Uh, Father, we pray that you would allow peace to reign. Father, we pray for those who are sick during this time of year. Uh, We pray for their healing, but also that you would give them peace in their suffering. And God, we pray that on this second Sunday of Advent, uh, a season where we celebrate your coming, we ask that today you would come. Send your Holy Spirit in our midst. Lift us in our minds and our souls up to heaven so that as we engage in worship over the next hour, Uh, God, that we wouldn't just do something because it's the thing that we've always done or because it's fun to do, but God, because we are encountering you, the living God and your son, Jesus Christ, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Uh, God, he sits at your right hand at this very moment, and that's exactly where we want to be. And so, Father, I pray that our songs and and the the tithes that are given, uh, the reading of your word, the prayers that are lifted would be lifted to your throne room. And God, that we would encounter you, uh, Father, this day. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Second Sunday of Advent, the peace candle. Today we light the peace candle. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. 
Luke chapter 2, verse 13 through 14. Jesus is sent by the Father to bring peace between God and man. We are caught up in struggle, strife, and sin. Jesus doesn't come, however, to smooth over our sins. Nor does he come with armed might to force us to lay down our arms. Rather, he comes to die for the sins that lie at the heart of our rebellion against him. He comes with peace, taking upon himself our sins and our need. As Isaiah predicts, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5 and 10. To receive his peace this Christmas comes with him in surrender, and though this act of faith received his, received his grace of for forgiveness and um, salvation. May you please bow your heads with me. Father, forgive us for our selfish, rebellious hearts. We open ourselves to you and invite you to come into our fresh and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Today. Good? That's great. Well, I want to tell you about um, something that, um, we'll start off with what um, my, my family does at Christmas. We draw names. Have y'all ever heard of that? Like you draw names and, and um, you have a person that you're going to buy a gift for. And then when they open it, it'll be the, the person that I've got their name, they'll know it. It's come from me, but right now it's a big secret. Nobody knows who's got each other's name. But the person that I have is actually in this room today. But that's a big secret because they can really <laughs> all wear a wonder. They can wonder if it's them. Okay, but what I want to do with this person is I want to know something about them, right? If I don't buy them a gift, I'm, I'm going to want to know. I want to know what maybe their hobbies are, what they like to do. Um, that kind of thing. So when I get their gift, I know they're going to like it. Okay? So it's kind of like um, when Jesus came, I just want to stress to each of you that Jesus has all of our names. He has drew us all. And he wants to offer us a gift. And it's not just any gift. It's not a gift that we can go to Walmart and buy or go to the mall and buy. No, there's no price on this gift. It is worth more than anything anybody can think of because it's him. And he is the greatest gift of all. So I want to show you. Now, this box right here might be for the, well, I don't know. I'll have to decide. But that might be for whatever I get for the person I have their name, okay? But in this box, we have baby stuff that stuff I don't know when I got the nursery. I got them at the Christmas. And y'all, as many gifts as we can receive, there's no gift like Jesus. And he has our name. He's calling our name. And he wants us to come and be his children. Okay? Sound good? All right, well, let's pray. Well, Father, this morning, around these children, God, may they just have had some, some um, learn something this morning through all the prayers and all of our service here that where we're honoring you, Lord, and we acknowledge 
these are two of the greatest gifts of life, and there is no price tag that can be put on what you have done for us. And so it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote this song um, in the midst of the Civil War, and he battled with depression. He had had a tough life. His wife had passed away in a fire, and he was a widower of six children. The oldest had been injured in the war. And on Christmas Day, 1863, he sat depressed, wanting to write a poem about the world around him on a day of celebration. And as he began to write, he heard the bells on that Christmas day and heard the singing of peace on earth. And so he wrote this poem. And in the first two verses, he starts talking about the familiarity of all the songs and the wonderful bells. And then in verse three, he settles in on the depression that's inside of him and says, how can we sing peace on earth when there's such turmoil and hate around us. But then in verse 4 and verse 5, he settles in on the faithfulness of God and, and says, bring the bells on. I love this song. And so we're going to sing every verse, and I want you to sing it out this morning. Let's stand as we sing. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. And follow the story along, would you? Would y'all uh, would y'all pray with me, Father, Daddy? Thank you for this day. Thank you for life's breath. Thank you for uh, for create, creating this world where we can live in, and Father, love each other. That's that's why you put us here. This season, Father, gets busy. It seems it seems like everything is vying for our time and our whatever we have. Father, it seems like there's something af after it. Help us to. Slow it down. Give us the strength, Father. Give us your spirit to uh, help us to slow it down. 
Thank you, Father, for the things that you've done through this little church and through its membership. Lord, we prepare, Father, to give. Help us to uh, not only just let a, this season be a, a giving season, let our whole lives, Father, throughout the year be a giving thing. For again, Father, I think that's what you put us here for, is to love and give to each other. Strengthen us, Father, weaken us, whatever it takes to where we become what you want us to be. Help us to strive to do that, Father, to ask you for that spirit each morning to do what we need to do that day for you and for each other. Thank you again for loving us. We thank you most for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.
Marilyn and Haley for playing. Thanks to Pat Linnell for directing us today. And always, thank you to the sound booth crew. We don't always see, but y'all do such an important work in making sure we can read, hear. <laughs> That's the most important thing uh, in our worship service, and thank you for that service. I love that song. Uh, obviously, I love the Christmas cantata that the choir sang last week, but it combines two of my favorite passages in Scripture, uh, one of those being Philippians 2, uh, verses 1 through 11, which exhort us as Christians to have the same mind among ourselves that Jesus Christ had among himself, uh, namely that he emptied himself and uh, made himself nothing and was born in the likeness of a human being uh, as a servant, as a slave. And, and not even did he do that, but he did that to the point of death, even death upon the cross. And therefore, it says, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's one. The second is in Revelation 5, which I happened to read in my devotion in my quiet time on Friday morning, uh, which is about Jesus, the Lamb, who is exalted in the throne room of heaven, what I prayed earlier in our service today. And all of creation in that moment bears witness to the fact that Jesus not only is the Lamb who was slain, but he is the living Son of God who is worthy with the Father to receive all of our praise and glory. So choir, I want to just thank y'all for singing that song. It's just an amazing uh, truth. It fits well with the sermon today. And we didn't coordinate that. It just happened to be that way. All right. If you have your Bibles with you today, I'd invite you to turn to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. Continuing in our series of Advent, we're going to continue through Isaiah's four songs of the servant. And a few weeks ago, I preached on Isaiah 42, which was the first of those. Uh, today we'll be in Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 13. This is the second of those four servant songs. So if, once you've found your place in God's holy and perfect word, and if you're able, I'd ask that you please stand for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 13. This is the servant speaking. Listen to me, O coastlands. Give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me... From the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord, my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I've answered you. In the day of salvation, I've helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, and those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, on all the bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them, for he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water he will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar. Behold, from the north, from the west, from the land of Syene. Sing for joy, O heavens, exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you be seated? Please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, you have given us the Holy Scriptures so that as we hear them, read them, mark them, and learn them, that we might be transformed more into the image of your Son, who is the fulfillment of the Bible. I pray today that you would help us to witness him 
and the prophecies that were foretold. God, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is, well, if any of you all have ever seen the Mission Impossible movies, you know that line is in every single one. That those words are told to Tom Cruise's character, Ethan Hunt, at the beginning of, a mo- of each movie. And he's also told, should you or anyone on your team get caught, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your actions. Good luck. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Oh, you can guess what happens in each movie. Again, if you've seen one, you've nearly seen them all. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm saying there's some similar features in the plot. He has a mission. There's going to be some high-speed car chases, a femme fatale who he partners with to accomplish the mission. There's going to be some elaborate disguise, always involving a lifelike mask of a person. And Tom Cruise is going to do his own insane stunts. And it's always going to finish between Ethan, with the standoff between Ethan Hunt and the big bad guy on the other side. Okay, and, you know, I, I haven't seen them all, to be honest, but um, they keep making them. So I'm assuming he survives. Um, it's kind of like James Bond. You, you, you know there's always going to be another one. Uh, if they kill him, they can't make, his, they can't make money anymore. So they've got to keep, keep him alive. But here's the thing. Before any of that craziness ensues, right before the motorcycle chases or him calling, climbing up skyscrapers or whatever it might be, Ethan Hunt has to accept the mission. The mission, should you choose to accept it, is. He doesn't know all the details of the mission. He doesn't know how he's going to accomplish the mission. But he has to say yes or no. And if he says yes, which he always does, then he's going to have to find out a way. Well, in a similar way, in the Bible, God has a mission for his people. Really, you might be thinking about the Great Commission right now, which is certainly relevant to this, but it reaches back even further before that in the Bible. Even on Genesis 12, in the earliest text of the Bible, God says to Abram, go from your land and from your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I I will bless those who bless you and I will dishonor those who dishonor you. I will curse. And in you, listen to this line. This is in Genesis 12, not Matthew 28. Genesis 12. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. The world is a place that is marred by sin and God starts moving at the very beginning to solve that problem, right? Sin has left scars upon humanity, the most severe that we are liable to God's judgment. But God has purposed that this man, Abraham, whom God called against all odds to give a family, which would eventually become a nation, right? God seals the call upon his life. He makes a covenant pact with Abraham that This is something that will be accomplished. And guess who the guarantor of that agreement is? It's God. And he reaffirms that covenant with each subsequent generation, eventually with the whole nation of Israel. So fast forward 400 years, God is carrying his people out of Egypt and they make it to Mount Sinai. And God says this in Exodus 19 to the whole nation of Israel now, not just one tiny family, but a whole nation. It says, the Lord called to Moses out of the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, tell the people of Israel... You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the people of Israel. If you go back in those verses and you notice that God begins recounting the salvation that he already did to deliver the Israelites. Their salvation was dependent upon God, not dependent upon their their own working. So he says, this is how I saved you. And then he talks about his election of Israel, his selection of this nation among all the nations of the world. Right? God's got them all. They all belong to him. But he's selected Israel. He's chosen them to accomplish this mission. Right? And this, you might think that, that gives them certain privileges, but it also comes with big responsibilities. For he says, here's the mission, you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Again, Israel, even though all the nations of the earth are his, Israel, he says, will be his treasured possession. 
right? They have a task, and, and, and God chose them, as Deuteronomy 6 through 8 tell us, if you read those chapters, God says, I chose you not because you were more in number than all the other nations. I didn't choose you because you were more righteous than all the other nations, but because I loved you. And because of that, God wants them to bless all the other nations. That's what it means for them to be a kingdom of priests. Priests are someone who mediates the blessing of God to others, to the world. In Israel, not just were they a kingdom that had priests, happened to have priests within them, they themselves, as a nation, were to be a kingdom of priests. They were to be reigned by God, and they were to mediate God's blessing to the world. And let me just go ahead and tell you something. This is a call that has been transferred upon to us in the church. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says it this way. You are a chosen race. This is him talking to the church now. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Doesn't that sound really similar, all that language he just used? A people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous, marvelous light. Well, back to Exodus. God has told the people that they are going to be his mediators, a blessing to the world. And then there's this moment in Exodus 24 where the people actually say, yes, we will do this. We agree to the covenant, God. And so God then has conferred this mission upon them. The, the, the covenant's ratified. They agree to God's terms. And here's the thing. If God offers to bless you, if he gives you a code of conduct, and says that you will be the instrument of blessing to the world, you should definitely say yes. That is the right answer. But again, if you read in Israel's history, you know that they never truly lived up to that, did they? Right, just rolled the tape forward eight chapters, and suddenly they are breaking the very first commandment that they shall have no other gods before him, they shall make no graven images. They do just that, right? Not only in idolatry, but also they indulge in revelry. There's a total theological and moral rebellion against God. And this is a pattern that it didn't just happen one time. As they get into the land eventually that God had promised them, this is something that occurs again and again. Sometimes it's because the people swell up and rebel against God and his leadership, but sometimes it's the leaders themselves that lead Israel down this path. Sometimes it's the king, sometimes it's the priest, right? And so God, he he is the one who's going to still accomplish the mission, one, but one wonders, though, if the mission that God had granted Israel was mission impossible. I mean, is this something that can even be done? Well, as we get into our text today, Isaiah is really wrestling with the same question. How, can, how is it possible that God's mission can be accomplished in the world, granted the weak state at the time of the nation of Israel, granted how they are depleted as a people, both financially, but also from a human resources perspective, they've suffered greatly. How in the world is this going to happen? Well, again, we noted, I've mentioned this before, we're we're looking at four texts between Isaiah 40 and 55 in this section of Isaiah that talk about the servant of the Lord, right? These are four songs in particular that talk about what the servant will accomplish, but often in these 15 chapters, whenever the servant is mentioned, it's actually referring to Israel. Just go with me for a moment to Isaiah 41, verses 8 through 10. It's said explicitly, but you, Israel, my servant... Jacob, whom I've chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you who I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I've chosen you, and I've not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Think about how much comfort that would bring to a people who had been totally depleted, They'd suffered the ravages of war and had come out on the other side much weaker than they were before. For them to hear, Israel, you are still my servant. I will be the one who holds you. You can see God's commitment to his people. And, but here's the thing. As we get into our text today in Isaiah 49, I think the plot thickens. It complicates a little bit because we don't read just about one servant. We read about two. It is indeed a tale of two servants. So I want us to take each one in turn today, and as we get into the text, here's what I hope that you'll see. God's true servant and son, Jesus Christ, accomplishes God's mission to bless the world, and by the Holy Spirit, calls and enables the people of God to participate in that mission to make God's glory known. Let me say that one more time. God's true servant and son, Jesus Christ, 
accomplishes God's mission to bless the world and by the Holy Spirit calls and enables the people of God to participate in that mission to make the glory of God known. We're going to, take, we're going to look at each servant in turn as we work through the text today. So the first servant we need to look at is Israel. So that's what we'll look at in our, today in our text. The first servant, Israel, they fell short of God's global mission. They fell short of God's global mission. Right, Isaiah, he permits the servant now. In, in, in Isaiah 42, it was God speaking about the servant. Here in Isaiah 49, it's actually the servant himself who speaks in Isaiah's writing. And he summons his audience to listen. And again, we know, I've already spoiled this for you, the servant we're talking about is Israel. Verse 3, in, in just a few verses, makes that clear. But here's what the servant says in verse 1. Listen to me, O coastlands. You peop- give attention, you people from afar. Right, the, the, the servant is issuing their call out broadly. So maybe they were Israelites who had been exiled to a far away place, but even the nations that are not Israelite, they're to hear this message from the servant. Right, in, in, the, in the face of these peoples, it's almost in verse two, or in, 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 the, in, the, in verse one, I mean, a, a bragging of one's status as God's servant. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. Now, you might remember that the first person named Israel in the Bible didn't start off with that name, right? If you go back to Abraham's lineage in Genesis, there's actually a person who we know as Jacob. It's Abraham's grandson, and uh, just like Abraham and his wife Sarah struggled to conceive a child, his son Isaac and his wife Rebekah also struggled to conceive. We're told that uh, Rebekah prays to the Lord, and, and he not only gives her one child in the womb, but two. There's twins. And the text says that they struggled together in her womb, so she interceded to them before the Lord. And here's what God says in Genesis 25, 23. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, but here's the key. The older shall serve the younger. So the babies are born. Esau, the older twin, is the one who, in the long run of the story, ends up being the one subservient to the second twin, the younger son, Jacob. God reaffirms the covenant with Jacob later in the book of Genesis. It shows us that God's blessing doesn't pass on to the next generation merely via birthright, but rather because of God's calling. So, But anyway, back to Isaiah. So there's a servant who's been called from the womb, Jacob. The, the nation of Israel sprung forth from this man. And now Israel, the person, and Israel, the people, are identified together. What was the purpose? Back to Isaiah 49, verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow, a quiver. He hid me away. Well, what does it mean for the mouth of the servant to be a sharp sword? I think it means that Israel has a prophetic task in the world. Right? It was their mission from God to bear witness to this God to tell the nations about him. And furthermore, Hebrews 4.12, what does it tell us? That God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce into the middle of our soul between the joints and the marrow to expose who we are before God. Right? Israel was to have that task, to bear prophetic witness in a world, but too often they accommodated to the world. And so God concealed Israel for a while, but now we know the secret, and God intends to continue to use them in his mission. He says in verse 3, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. There is still a role for Israel, for the people of God, in the plan to accomplish the mission. But how, how did they do? Look at verse 4. Look at the disposition. This is what Israel says. I say I've labored in vain. I spent my strength for nothing in vanity, yet surely my right is with the Lord, my recompense is with my God. It could be that Israel is upset with God. Right? Maybe you've trumpeted about God's goodness and kindness and provision to you. Only then, a few weeks later, maybe sometimes even a few hours later, things turn upside down in your life. Right? Maybe you even bragged a little bit on yourself, kind of a humble brag. I spent so much time praying, and you know, I, I prayed for an hour every day, and God did give me the thing I wanted. God has really blessed me with a ministry of abundance, we might say. He's provided a lot for me or more to me with many material possessions. But then things go sideways. They always will at some point. What happens when you step back and realize that maybe at times you weren't always pursuing God, but maybe you were pursuing your own glory? You didn't really have the, way, you didn't really have the ability to see that in the moment. 
I think we would do well just to pause for a moment and consider what were some of the things that distracted Israel from that mission. Right, they're discouraged, but again, some of the source of their discouragement results from generations and centuries even of their disobedience to God. So what were some of the things that got them off track? Well, one of them, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, was idolatry. There were times that Israel didn't only worship God alone exclusively, but rather they worshiped the gods of the other nations. Right? Even if we aren't tempted by the gods of other major world religions, the prevailing belief in our world today puts ourself at the center. Right? We kind of make ourself divine. We may not even say that language, but we center ourselves, and everything else revolves around us and our experience. So that's one thing that Israel did. They would go into idolatry. The other thing is that they would live into sin without restraint. So, you know, God had given Israel the law. Right, right after he called them in Exodus 19 and Exodus 20, he gave them the Ten Commandments, and then other commands. But as simple as the Ten Commandments seem to us, once you live life a little while, you realize why God gave those Ten Commands, even though as simple as they are, they're the foundation for so many things. You realize that they become less easy to keep. Right? Israel demonstrated, which is what ancient Rome demonstrated, which is common in our world today, that it's really difficult and challenging to honor God with our sexuality. Right? It's easier to believe in categories of sexual wellness for all people. And I'm not saying people should be repressed. That's not what I'm saying. But to use that as an example and as a license to do things that God had commanded us not to do. To examine forms of deviant sexuality that the Bible is pretty clear are wrong and to just say, well, that's okay. We'll be affirming of those things. Right? And we could talk about sex as one category, but there are other things. We could talk about covetousness. I mean, goodness gracious, it's Christmas time. Right? And we're excited about celebrating Jesus, but we also are pretty excited about the gifts that we are going to get and we're going to receive on Christmas Day. Right? The, the, the retailers don't, sell, don't send us catalogs unsolicited for no reason. They want to incite longing and covetousness within us so that we want what our neighbor has. Right? We can find easy ways to justify hatred in our lives or perhaps lying. We could just live into that. And that's one of the ways we can get sidetracked from the mission God had placed upon our lives. So we could pursue other gods, we could get sidetracked into sin, we could live into that. The third thing we can do is we can just become inwardly focused. Right? We are God's people whom he's called, but this can lead to kind of two errors. One is that we enjoy God's blessing without engaging in the mission he's given us. We could say we enjoy the privileges of salvation, but we don't actually take up any of the responsibilities that he's, he's called us to take up. Or we might even fall into something that's more common today, which is to believe that it's wrong to impose our beliefs upon others. Now, again, I'm not saying we should be rude about that, but here's what I'm saying. We need to have a firm conviction about the truth of the gospel. We shouldn't be embarrassed to exhort people to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord. Now, again, there are ways you can do that as a bully, or there's ways you can do that like Jesus and welcome people into the faith. Right? But we can accidentally slink into a posture where we really never advocate for the truth of what God has called us to believe and to do as a people. So those are, again, regardless of why Israel failed, they're frustrated right now. Israel's confessing that they're tired. Maybe they're just exasperated by pursuing the vain gods of the other nations, and now they're ready to be used by God. Well, here's the good news about God. Even when we fail, God is still faithful. He doesn't give up. He's jealous for us, right? To, to think about God's jealousy means that whenever we get sidetracked, God will not stop until we are back into his fold, okay? And so God is always willing, able, ready to forgive. He's able and wanting to receive us back. And so the way that God restores Israel and continues the global mission that he gave to Abraham is by sending another servant. And that's what I want us to spend the rest of our time discussing today is the second servant. Isaiah 49, verses 5 through 12. The second servant, Jesus, who fulfills God's global mission. Now, look at verse 5. It says, Now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, here's the thing, to bring Jacob back to me, to him. The second servant can't be Israel because the role of the servant is to bring back Israel. There has to be someone else. I'm honored in the eyes of the Lord. My God has given me strength. It sounds very similar to the ministry that God gave, or that Jesus gave the apostles in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. He sends them out to go preach the gospel, to heal, to cast out demons, and he says, 
But don't go to the Gentiles right now. First, go to the lost sheep of Israel. But we know that there is still a universal global mission that is coming. And think about Jesus, the one who was formed in his mother's womb, right? During this Advent and Christmas season, we think about the fact that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that she would carry a son in her womb who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, who would save his people, who would save God's people from their sins. The first task is to bring back Jacob, but here's what verse 6 says. It's too light a thing that you should be my servant only to bring back Jacob and to raise up the tribes, to bring back the preserved of Israel. But there's more. I will make you, listen, as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. But the paradigm seems to be that this same one, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it's the same paradigm that he hands to Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 1 to the apostles. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria. That's, that's, gen, that's Jewish territory, but also to the ends of the earth. We, you see that phrase, ends of the earth, again and again in this talk about mission. What this means is that God is turning towards his worldwide mission. It's, that's the calling that God has placed upon his people. That's why we... The calling for global missions is placed upon our lives personally, on our, us as a church. Not just generally, but when it's a work that we should be personally invested in. And that mission is not going to be without trial. Look at verse 7. It says, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, His Holy One, to one who is deeply despised and abhorred by the nation. Right? Jesus was not accepted. He was the servant of rulers. But here's what happens to those rulers. Verse 8 says, or verse 7, I mean. Kings shall see and arise princes. They shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who's chosen you. Right? The nations will believe in Jesus Christ. God's second servant, his son Jesus Christ, is worshiped and glorified along with the Father everywhere in the world today. And here's the thing, he not only fulfills Israel's global mission to go to Gentiles as well as to Jews, but his death creates a new people who are called to continue in that work. Right? Verses 8 through 12 kind of reflect that restoration. The servant comes and he makes it possible for people to be freed from their bondage and to go through all types of rough terrain in order that they might get to the place that God has prepared for them. Uh, they might, the, the, even though they go through harsh circumstances, they will not be in need because verse 10 says, he who has pity on them will lead them by springs of water and will guide them. But Isaiah continues to speak of the nations flowing to the servant. Look at verses 11 and 12 in our passage. I will make all my mountains a road. So the, the hard, rocky you know, paths, I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna level them. The highways will be raised up. They shall come from afar, behold, from the north and the west, even to the land of Syene. People are going to flow everywhere to where God is. God can save them in South Africa. He can save them in Gaza. He can save them in China. He can save them in California. He can even save people in Calhoun County, Alabama, y'all, okay? Whenever we talk about taking the gospel to our neighbors and the nations, we need to be very serious about that. Because not only does Jesus accomplish this, but he creates servants to take up this task. Right? The, I, I, there's a, a, a 20th century Baptist Old Testament scholar named H.H. H. Rowley. He was British. You, you probably, there's no reason you would have ever heard of him before. But he really wanted to take up this theme. He had served um, whenever he was an early scholar as a missionary to China for seven years before just kind of the growing nationalist movement in China forced him to leave. But he really wants us to understand that not only does Jesus have a mission himself, but he calls the people to participate in that mission. Here's what he said. Right? Salvation is election. It's a calling, one which, here's what it does. It lifts us up into the will of God and makes us living centers of divine influence, linking, the, linking them, linking us with the purpose of God in the world to infuse all of the purposes of our lives and enabling us to present the character of God in all of our activities. Salvation is both, listen to this, a gift to be humbly received and gratefully enjoyed, we receive salvation from God. It's all his work. We are the beneficiaries of it. It is also, salvation is also a power for the fulfillment of the highest obligations that lay upon those who receive it. 
It's not alone something that God does for man, but something which he achieves in us. Whenever God saves us, whenever he sends his Holy Spirit upon us, it's because he is calling us and sending us out to bear witness to do the work that he's called his people to do. It's very much the same line that Ephesians 2, 8, and 10 say. For it is by grace that you are saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. So salvation is all of God's work. But verse 10, for we, those who have been saved by God's work, are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God saved us by grace, and he has prepared a work for us to do. Remember this. God's true servant and son, Jesus Christ, accomplishes God's mission to bless the world and by the Holy Spirit calls and enables the people of God to participate in God's global mission to make his glory known. How can we here in Pleasant Valley, in Williams, Jacksonville, Alabama, Calhoun County, Etowah County, wherever you live, how can we here in this place participate in that global mission? One way is we can be faithful exactly where we are. Okay, that means whomever your neighbors are, we need to make sure that we're testifying to the gospel to them. Now, in an olden age, that might have meant going door to door and knocking on every door and letting people know. That may or may not be the method you pursue today, but regardless, God has called you to bear witness to him now. The second way is we can participate in God's global mission here. We have the privilege of being in a university town that has an international house. Now, I'm not saying that we should, you know, we should bombard and berate all the international students. One, assuming that they're not Christians. Two, uh, just disrespectfully saying, well, then if you're here in Jacksonville, Alabama, you need to come to church and do all these things. But we can engage with them, right? That means it's, a, it's part of a broader process of opening our homes and hospitality. Uh, one of the things that's true about international students is 80% will graduate and will have never entered into the home of a Native American citizen. Well, not, not, you know, not Native American as an American Indian, but just like of, of someone who's a U.S. citizen, right? So they'll, they'll have been here for four years, stayed on campus, done all the work, and then they go home. One of the ways in which we might participate in that work is to just invite them to the table, allow them to share a meal, talk about their home culture, talk about yours. But one of the things that's true about your culture if, is if, if you're a Christian, you can talk about that. You don't have to be, you know, um, rude about it. You don't have to be forceful about it, but you can be honest about it. So that's another thing you can do, right? But again, it's not just with the international students. Everyone here, everyone on Jacksonville State's campus, everyone here in our community needs to hear the gospel, but we do get to participate in God's global mission by looking at how God brings the nations even sometimes to us. Here's the third thing you can do, is you can pray. And um, you can pray in an increasingly specific way. Paul Borthwick is a mission strategist, and he writes about this method. You can pray, pick a nation somewhere. So we'll pick England. So pray for the people of England, and then pick a city. We'll go to London. It's a big city. Now pray for a particular people group within that city. So let's pray for people who are of African descent, who have migrated to London, or of West Indy descent from the Caribbean and have migrated to London who are either atheists or Muslims. That's a large population group there. Now pray, you've got a nation and a city and, and a people. Now pray for a church there. We're gonna pray for Stockwell Baptist Church. Okay, not, not just because they're Baptist, although that's a perk. Now, beyond praying for the church and their ministry there, pray for a person. We're gonna pray for Yannick and Katan Christus Lahab. These are real friends of mine in a real church in a real place. He's the pastor of that church. Pray that God would encourage him in his work as he ministers to his own people. And then finally, once you've done that, pray at the personal level. What would God have you do in this moment to participate in reaching that people group? Right, maybe, there's, maybe it's just your prayers, but maybe it's to find a way you can send support. Maybe it's a way you can send an encouraging note to them. But remember that the work isn't only about us. We belong to a family of God around the world, from all tribes, tongues, peoples, and nations who are worshiping the Lord today. First Baptist Church of Williams, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to become servants following the true servant of God, Jesus the Christ, and to make his glory known. God has chosen to make us his instruments. It's not just that he's given a mission to his people, 
He's got a people, or he has a mission, and he's created a people to do that mission. It's not just that he has a people and he's given them a mission. He has a mission, and he's created a people for that. He's created us. So I want you to pray during this time, I mean, today, but even in this Advent season, as we consider the work of Jesus Christ, the servant of God, how God would encourage, how he would call you to participate in the mission that he's doing. Again, I pray that's active here and wherever you go. We want to see God's glory known on the whole earth as the water covers the sea. If you would, please bow your head with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are such a great and big God that you don't only belong to us. All the peoples of the world belong to you. And indeed, because sin is universal, it's affected and infected every person who's ever lived and all those who are alive today. God, it doesn't matter where we find ourselves in the world, wherever people might live, uh, it is a place where the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to go, needs to penetrate into people's lives. They would not only hear this word, but that they would believe in the person, that they would have an encounter with the true and living God, Jesus Christ, and that through him they would come to know you, Father that your spirit would work among them. So we do pray for our brothers and sisters around the world. We pray for my brother Yannick and his church, Stockwell Baptist Church in London, that you would bless them today as they endeavor to reach their neighbors and their context. God, but we also pray for the global church, for our brothers and sisters who are worshiping even now, but also who are serving, who are going out into their own communities. God, we pray those who are at risk of danger for this task, that you would keep them safe, but more than that, you would keep them faithful to the task. God, may we be faithful. God, uh, your, your son, Jesus Christ, is so good. Help us to not just think that our salvation confers all these privileges but doesn't claim anything upon us, but that if you've saved us, you've claimed us for all the works that you prepared beforehand. Help us to walk in them. God, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Be seated. Before we go today, I have a couple things uh, we need to do. One of them, uh, they don't involve me, though. So they kind of do, but they're not really. So the first thing is not about me at all. Our brother Phil Holmes is with us today with his uh, dear mother, Millie. And Phil Phil wanted to come and share a word uh, with our congregation. I appreciate it. Pastor Ryan, letting me take just a couple of minutes because I feel like the Holmes family, I need to represent us to, to, to speak to you of the incredible love that you demonstrated to our family, and you always have, but during my dad's passing particularly. And I just want to say how much we love you all. We thank you for being the body of Christ. I've um, been reading in a book and the scripture, one of the scriptures in this book that I've been reading is uh, 2 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 3. And my phone just messed up. But it says, blessed be the God of the Father, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts and encourages us with every trouble so that we will be able to comfort and encourage those who are in any kind of trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
I really believe that scripture was demonstrated so beautifully by this church body. It was like a gift that the Holy Spirit poured out on you all. And you may not even be aware that that's a gift from him, but it is. It's a true spiritual gift that he, he gave you the comfort of all of these collective years together. He's built this body with strengths, and that's one of your strengths is how you love so Christ-like. And our family got to experience that. The very day Dad died, people were coming into the home, coming in just being, not necessarily needing to say a lot, but just conversing and just being with us. And from that whole week, that whole process was a, a beautiful display of the love of Christ through you. And I'm just so eternally grateful for that. I, I grew up as I was sitting in the back row there with mom, just right over here somewhere. I was a fidgety four and five-year-old. And mom would wear a watch on her arm, and she would let me lay my head in her lap, and I would listen to the tick-tock of the second hand on that watch to sort of calm me down so that the pastor could get through with the message <laughs> and uh, without such a distraction. And just, uh, you've been a part of my life all of my life. I started coming to this church when I was three and I'm just you're so grateful, so touched by your generosity of love and your comfort that you showed us. It meant so much to us. And although I've been away for so many years, you're still my family. You're still my siblings. I still think of you as family, and we all do, and we care for you dearly, and we're just so grateful. Thank you, Pastor Ryan, for allowing me to say how much we appreciate all that you did for our family. The, the food uh, after, the, after the funeral, the food... And the fellowship hall was just a gift of love. And um, because you can tell I'm a big boy, I know how to eat. And um, so I'm just so grateful for all the, your demonstration of love. And, and I appreciate Pastor Ryan letting me say that. Your, your mother, Millie, you, your brother, Greg, and your uh, sister, Ivy, uh, and we loved your father. He was a blessing here, and uh, as a newcomer here, it was an amazing testament to his uh, impact um, upon the congregation to be, stand at the visitation and just stand in line and talk to them before they got to you uh, to filter out all the great stories uh, that people were sharing about his impact, but also we're thankful for you. We love you. Love okay. you, too. Yeah, Thank thanks. You. Yeah. Uh, the second item we have to d discuss today is uh, I just want to take a moment and pause and reflect upon um, as the pastor of this church, but also as kind of the supervisor of the staff, um, just how thankful I am and how thankful we all as a church are uh, to the, our church staff members who labor week in and week out here and uh, make sure that the, um, the, the wheels keep running, so to speak. The work of the church, I want, I want to be clear, is not the work that I or the staff do. The work of the church is the work that we do together. But the staff do play an important role, and I think we could all agree and testify to that. And so uh, we just wanted to uh, take a moment to uh, thank them and to say Merry Christmas to them, to appreciate them today. They didn't even know this was coming, so it's a surprise to all of them. Um, so I'm going to invite them to come down forward, and we have the church has a Christmas gift we'd like to give to each of them. Um, Peggy Green, and Peggy is uh, special for a number of years. Um, if, in case you forgot, Peggy's days here are numbered, and it's not because it's not because thirty three. <laughs> <laughs> thirty three, yeah. Uh, Peggy is retiring uh, in January, and we actually are going to celebrate her on January 14th. So uh, this is one gift now for Christmas, but we're going to we're going to party for you even bigger in a month. Okay, so that's, what we uh, do. that's right. <laughs> so just mark that on your calendars, January 14th. But Peggy, we're thankful Thank for you, you. Christy, Christy McLeod. Oh. 
I'm just going to read all, no, stay up here, Peggy, stay up, you can't go. Uh, Christy McLeod, the newest member to the team. Christy, we're so thankful that you are a part of the team now. Uh, yeah, oh, thank you. Some of our staff aren't here because they're out there doing their job, um, so we will thank, we'll, we'll say their name, and if they can't come in, we'll just make sure you thank them later. Uh, Nikki Haynes is one. Pat and Linnell Barker, who do a wonderful job every week leading us with the music. Come on. You come down, too. <laughs> Marilyn Ingram and Haley Jackson, y'all come on down as well. All right, um, our uh, daycare director, Leanne Hanby, invite her down. And I'm going to go ahead and call others because they have further to walk, but uh, Mike Duncan, our custodian, but also coordinates our senior adult ministry and uh, kind of heads up the sound booth in the back. We want to thank Mike. Uh, he's waving. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, uh, there are people who... Uh, volunteer each week to make this happen. I thank them, but also today we wanted to thank them especially, and it's our sound booth volunteers. So Emily Duncan and Kevin Browning, we're thankful to you all. We have a gift for you. All right. Um, we have some wonderful nursery workers. Sharon Williams, are you still in here, Sharon? Okay. Sharon is in, she's... She, she's not abdicating her duty. Uh, our other wonderful nursery worker, Jill Green, is in the nursery, and they rotate there. But because Sharon's here, we're going to thank her publicly and just make sure you thank Jill pub, uh, privately later on. There you go. Uh, also, he's not in the room because he's never in the room. It's Brent Thomas. Uh, we don't appreciate, or we, we do appreciate, but we don't see what Brent does because he's always out in the parking lot not only greeting but also making sure that we're safe. Uh, so we want to thank Brent. Uh, we'll give him a round of applause, yeah. too. And um, I had several co-conspirators who helped make this happen. Uh, one of them uh, is someone who does a, a big role in this church, uh, and that is Lamar Freeman, our church administrator. Lamar, you're in the back. You can't hide. you got to come down. Uh, Lamar not only helped make this appreciation happen, but Le Lamar kind of keeps us straight with record to our bylaws and our and our. Uh, whenever we have business meetings, he's our moderator, and we're thankful to you, Lamar. So thank you so much for your service. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so, would y'all please give one more round of applause to our church staff? All right, thank you. Y'all can y'all can go now. Uh, let me just say, while they're up here, before they go, let me just say a word of, of benediction and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of worship. We thank you. We do thank you for the staff, and we thank you for the ways in which they serve our entire congregation. We thank you for uh, other people who volunteer in key roles to help uh, just ensure that the worship of the church happens every single week. Uh, God, I also thank you for our church body. Again, the people who do the work of the church and who are the ones who accomplish the mission that you've given us. God, as we go forward this week, during this second week of Advent, uh, God, we pray that you would help us to bring the good tidings of Jesus wherever we might go. And as we consider the peace of Christ, help us to be beacons of peace. Father, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.